are to the to the quiz. Okay, my first question it will be A B C D, and then you pick up the one that you want. Okay, what is the purpose of the book of Revelation? Okay, that's the question. What is the purpose of the book of Revelation? Number one, to show who is the Antichrist. A, show who is the Antichrist. B, show what must take place. C, scare people. And D, tell when Jesus will come. What is the correct answer? B. B, which is? Oh, you are so clever. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. But maybe some of them didn't know. So, okay. So, you, now you know. And which chapter do you find a blessing to those who read and keep the word? Aha. Now I got you. No A, B, and C this time. Aha. Uh -huh. Which chapter? 5, 22, 21, or, or 1? One, chapter one. You have a blessing if you read the book of Revelation. So if you want to be blessed, read it often. It will, you will bring a blessing to you. Okay. And which chapter does the Lamb open the seals of the scroll? 10, 13, 5, 4, 19. Five. Okay. Yes, I got you again. Yes. Don't don't trust the intonation of my voice. Okay. If I say nineteen, that means five. Okay. It's okay. 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 And which? Oh, this one is a very difficult one. And which chapter is the first earthquake mentioned? Oh, nobody knows this one. Six. Okay. How many? Earthquakes are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Three. Okay. All right. Okay. I knew I was going to get you. Yes. Okay. And which chapter does the beast come from the ocean or the sea? Thirteen. Nine. Seventeen. Or five? Thirteen. Yes. Okay. And which chapter are the four horse and the riders in Revelation? 12, 18, 3, or 9? 6, I didn't mention it. <laughs> I'm very like a... <laughs> How many churches are mentioned in Revelation? Seven. Oh, wow, this one was an easy one. Okay, <laughs> so now you know where we are going this morning. We are going into the book of Revelation. And I've been reading and listening. I'm terminating my last year reading plan in Revelation, so it gives me all sorts of inspiration. So I'd like to end the year and begin the new year with, a, I don't know, a short series over a revelation. Not in the, with the purpose of interpreting the who's who and who is the horse and who is the, the, the thing, but in order to find some of the exhortation in the books. Because it says that we are blessed, isn't it? If we hear and we read and we keep it. So there is something in that book, even though they are describing events to come, there are something in that book that address to every generation's believers. So these are the points that I would want to, to bring up to us, to, to stir us up in our faith and everything. So, the purpose of the book of Revelation is mentioned very, very clearly. And the text that we are going to look in uh, first text, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, the revelation of Jesus Christ, yes, we can look now, Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, for what? To show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So that is the purpose. And John is the receiver of that vision. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, and he wrote to all that he saw. Number three, the promise. Blessed is the one who reads aloud. Reads aloud. Or listen to your audio device. 
but read aloud, read aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear, blessed are those who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. How near? We don't know, but it is dear. John to the seven churches. The rest is a description of Christ and his glory and his exalted position, the rest of the chapter. And verse 11, it says, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. And the chapter 2 and chapter 3, if I ask you a quiz next week, are the, the, the letters to the seven churches. Okay. So, Revelation 1.19 is tells us the inspired outline of this book. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen. You have seen something. Those that are the present time and those that will take place after this. So then when we go a bit further into chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, now we will begin a new division of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And after this point forward, there is no mention of the church of, as a body on earth mentioned anywhere. You don't see the church. It's not addressed to the church. This is when uh, most scholars believe that at that point when it says this is the rapture, the, the point, the crucial point where the church will be taken, taken up. So come up here and I will show you what must take place after this, after the church will be uh, removed. John illustrates what will happen to God's people when the church age comes to its end. Heaven will open, there will be a voice and the sound of a trumpet, and the saints will be cut up to heaven. We read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We have another also explanation in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse, verse 52. In the twinkling of an eye, the rapture will take place. But uh, then the judgments of God will begin on earth. Okay. But before God pours out his wrath on, on the earth, he gives us a glimpse into glory before all of these disasters and these judgment takes place and the trumpets and the balls and the, the anger of God and the indignation of God comes. You see the glory of God depicted. You see many uh, living beings around the throne. You see the thunder, the lightning, the, the glorious throne, descriptions of Jesus Christ and, the, and his glory. You see the elders, the 24 elders throwing their crown at his feet and worshiping and the angels worshiping. You see all a glimpse of the, the glory of God before the judgment comes in. And uh, so the worship there is presented for our instruction. You know, many times we, we call worship, we have ideas of worship, but if we want to know, have a good glimpse into what worship is and how um, not frightening, but like, uh, I don't know which word to use, like uh, deep and um, uh, meaningful and uh, ex exalted, like in, uh, the connection between the, the glory and the majesty of God is, is revealed for the worship. Then you look in these chapters and you, you will see it. The worship is presented for our instructions and our imitation. Then we come to chapter 5, and then we find a seven-sealed scroll in the hand of God. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and on the outside, both sides, just like a Roman scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. So you have no idea inside. And the scroll could not be read because it was sealed and, and covered. And John could see writing on both sides, which means that it was complete. 
Nothing could be added. It was a, a finished, uh, completed, and final. The skull represents, uh, we have heard uh, uh, Bible studies about that from uh, uh, Pastor Steve Nolens before, that the, this is the, the Christ title deeds, the redemption of mankind, where Christ, when he gave his sacrifice on the cross, went back to heaven, became our high priest, has become our kinsman redeemer, and he has set us free from the bondage of our sin, and he restored our lost inheritance because of sin and, attend, and yield, yielding to the, to the devil uh, and the Garden of Eden and for the rest of the uh, history of mankind. And as Christ removed the seals, the seven seals, various dramatic events takes place, each one of them. The seven seals introduce seven trumpets of judgment that leads into seven balls of judgment, and this is the climax of God's indignation against the sinfulness and the blasphemies and the, the rebellion of mankind uh, over, over his rulership. And the worship that is described in chapter 4 and 5 is in fact a preparation. And, and we need to understand that because uh, many times we do not understand fully enough the holiness of God. It's like uh, we, we, we have this in our mind, we, we know what it means, but we do not really fully, deeply understand the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. So we see the, the worship of God and then you see the terrible anger of God following is because the, the, the total picture of what God wants to accomplish and how the forces of evil have always opposed him and his long suffering, but eventually he will judge sins and revenge over his enemies and the persecutors of his uh, servants. Revelation chapter 6, uh, verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, Come! And then in chapter 6 and 7, these are the opening days of the revelation, the tribulation. And the first four seals, as each seal was opened, each four seals were opened, one of the four living creatures called out with a loud voice and a, a, a rider and a horse. And I want to take a, a, a moment for that. Put the picture on and I will read the text. Revelation 6 to a white horse. He comes and a white horse comes and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he came out conquering and to conquer. You see what he looks like. I mean, this is never, never enough. Like an illustration will never be enough to, to be the, the reality, but it's just an illustration. The white horse, the crown, the, the, the bow, uh, and he came out to conquer. Okay. He had a bow. Here you see an arrow, but there is no arrow. <laughs> Already. There's a bow, but there's no arrow, and we will talk about it in a moment. Then, verse 4, and out came another horse, bright red or fiery red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword, a great sword. I think it's greater than that. You know, if you read the, the, the text of the Bible and then study each uh, symbol that you find in these texts, you, you discover a little bit more. In verse 5, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hands. Here you see only one scales, and it's not really big, but he has a pair of scales. So we will talk about it in a moment. In verse 8, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider named, the rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. Hades is the place of the dead. So it's quite dramatic. So let's talk about the horses, and we will put the text now. Revelation chapter 6, verse 2 to 8. Okay? Just put the text. Okay. The horses represents God's activity on earth. The forces he used 
These are instruments. He allows them. He commands them. He gave orders through the majestic voice of the, 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 the creature, the living creatures, to accomplish his divine purpose. The time has come, so they are released, and they are doing exactly what they are being asked to do. So it's not like uh, by coincidence, it's not by man, it's not just by uh, a result of some type of event. It is in the time of God, it is in the calendar of God, and these are ordered by the Lord. So that this is important that we understand because sometimes we think oh, the way the world is going. It's not the way the world is going. It's the way God wants this time to begin and to be. So and there is a time, there is a voice, there is a command and there is a permission from God. God showing God is in control. This is not man's doing. This is not the Antichrist who decide this and that. They are instruments. God is the one who controls all of this. It shows that the events that will take place on earth are under God's direction in heaven through the mighty angels who speaks. The first horse, the white horse, that you see in verse 1 and 2, uh, the, uh, the Antichrist. Why do we say that? Uh, the future world dictator begins his career as a peacemaker. Okay, the Antichrist will solve the world's problem by uh, he will be received by the world as a great liberator. He will go from victory to victory, and finally the old world will be his. Okay, following him, he will be a deceiver. Um, this may represent uh, some form. How how some people interpret it? It's like it may come. In, in the form of some kind of a cold war, okay? Be, why do we say that? Because the, the bow is, is an offensive uh, weapon, but there is no mention of an arrow with, with this. And perhaps the suggestion uh, as a, a, a missile warfare, because you know the arrow is like a shooting or whatever it means. So I don't want to go into a lot of interpretation of that or distant combat. The rider does not actually cause warfare. He does not go to war. He just uh, has the bow, but he has not. He has the look as if he could go to war. As a, as a power, but he doesn't go himself to war. He's only as a bow. He doesn't have a sword or any kind. Until the second uh, seal come with the second horse, then there, there is still peace on earth, okay? The arrow is an offensive and deadly weapon used in distance strategy before the combat usually you you you, you send the now they, they send the air force first and they drop the bomb before the the foot soldiers will come so this is kind of a idea like this so before any comeback the the combat the fact that he has a bow but no arrow shows that his victories won't be through war more politically won he will be a, a man with great political influence and strategy he has a crown, which means that his position will be highly respected uh, worldwide. And the white horse makes him look like a righteous leader. It's, it's a white horse. It's a victorious. It's glorious. It looks uh, positive. Like uh, if you're on this side, you, t you think that you, you're on the right side. You know, he has a, the, 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 the white horse. This horseman has nothing kind about him. Though he, uh, he's riding on a horse, a white horse, there's nothing kind about him. He goes out conquering and to conquer. That's what he does. So it's not because he's kind. He's not, he's not concerned with the, the miseries of humanity. He's conquering the world. That's what he is doing. His intent is to kill, destroy, and subdue his enemy. His white facade is deceptive. He conceals uh, his deadly uh, uh, and unholy purpose. He is the one who commences or causes what will result in the death of a quarter of the Earth's population. So he starts something, and then later on, a quarter of the Earth's population will die because of what he is starting. So it's not a kind, uh, a kind person. That, that, that he goes on, on victory. So let's not be fooled by that. Verse 4. And out came another horse, fiery uh, red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Uh, here, uh, the first one is the Antichrist goes conquering, but then quickly the empty bow 
change for a, a big long uh, we uh, weapon that is you know the, the the sword a long sword and that is a symbol of of death uh, the color red is associated with terror and death and the red horseman with his fiery red horse his great sword uh, is going to be aggressive and is a fearful symbol that the conflict will be intensifying and horrific you are moving into something beyond what we have known. Even though we are used to see conflicts and war on TV, you see it now, but compared to what's coming, it's nothing. And it was granted to him. The Bible clearly, clearly, it was granted, the authority was granted to remove peace from the earth. So this is, again, God intends this figure to instill terror in mankind. And I assume that God's and the God's mercy, God wants that in times such as this, people will still have time to repent and to return to Him. Well, you know, when you're losing your mind, when you are so afraid of everything, that there are no resources, uh, and anyway, you turn to God. So I, I assume that God is trying to do that, to save uh, people from destruction and death. And he, what He does is that people should kill one another to take peace from the earth so it looks like civil war bloodshed and loss of control and a lot of violence on the face of the earth verse 5 and 6 and i looked and behold a black horse and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand and i heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine and here this black horse represents famine. Famine and war go together. So when you have one, usually you have the other one. To eat bread by weight uh, like, like this is a sign of a shortage of, of food. And usually shortage of food will always drive price up and force government to maybe ration whatever little that they have. I think we have a fresher idea that through the, the typhoon and the Philippines and the distributions of goods you know, and everything, it gives us an idea to understand what is uh, happening. And a pair of scales, I was thinking about that. Why a pair of scales? Why not only one? I was thinking, okay, a pair of scales, uh, maybe a, a symbol of uh, injustice. Of, of fraud, of uh, you know, like changing what what is uh, no equity. You you just uh, uh, you know remove all of equities or bri a system of briberies. You know you, you you don't have barley. You don't have enough money. So people abuse in time like this. The the price mentioned there. Uh, some people say that it is 12 times higher than the normal price. So it's a big, big uh, inflation. And uh, the, it's kind of the food of the poor will be very hard to, to, to buy. It costs a day's wage to buy what you will e eat for that, or that uh, one day. And then you see also, don't harm the oil and the wine. The harm and the wine usually are more uh, things of uh, uh, luxuries, items. And they will still be there. They will be protected. In times when people have nothing to eat and uh, the government has ra rations, there's always the rich. And the rich uh, always can get the oil and they can get whatever it is. Even if people are dying, they're queuing up, the groceries are empty, they will not uh, run out of, of food for themselves. So that, that's what we, we find in this one. Revelation 6 to 8. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and its rider names was death. And Hades followed him, and they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword and famine and with pestilence and with wild beasts on the earth. And that is symbol of total terror. Death is the things that scared people the most. Dying, the death of dying. And then not only death is there, but the Hades is following. So it's like emphasizing uh, how the, the number the great number of, of death and the terrors that will be and the, the slaughter and the devastation and the destructions of everything that normally would make life happy. 
a family happy, like the basic things that you know we, we rejoice over and we, we want to have for our basic life will be taken away from us and, and everything. And John saw all of these riders armed with wep these weapons, sword, hunger, pestilence, and wild beasts. And all of these things are known to follow wars. Where there is a, a war conflict, there, there will be all of these things uh, following. Power is given to the horsemen and given by God. And we need to know that. When all hell is breaking loose on the earth, God is still very, very much the one in control. And he still holds the scroll and opens the seal. This is one of the reasons why the book of Revelation has been a source of encouragement for the suffering believers of all generations, the book of Revelation, because, you know, people suffer for the name of Christ, have been suffering for the name of Christ, but there is a time when God will deal with all of this injustice and everything, when they will see the Lamb opening the seals, uh, when we read about it in the Bible, we realize that God is in control and that His purpose will be accomplished. So, you know, and I want to go to the next, the next text because it will answer one of the very important questions that we have. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Now after the fifth seals, uh, we see uh, other events. Like the four first seals were more about people and society, okay, that we have read. Now we are going to uh, read again about people, but we will see something uh, different. Now we see a new group of people uh, introduced to us. They are the first martyr of the tribulation. As I said before, in chapter 4, the church is removed. Now we are dealing with things that is going to happen on earth during this time. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. More will die. More will have to die. More will have to be slain. And more will be slain for the word of God and the witness again until the number of their brothers will be complete. Those who were to be killed as themselves uh, had been. Is there any hope for believers? after the church is removed? Is there, is there any hope for those who will turn to God and realize, maybe, you know, assume the things that we all talk to people, our families and all of this, and many people in the face of the earth, they have heard it some, somehow, and they will hear about the, the coming raptures and the, the judgment of God. And when these things will happen, they will still be here, and many will repent. They will repent and they, they will want to turn to God. You can imagine now, they, now it's, true, it's true. It was true. Oh, how fool I was to not have received the grace of God freely and to be saved. And now, now God, please, I want to follow you. And they will follow, but they will be slain. That's, that's a price. And that's why I, I believe uh, where you see them, they are under the altar. Okay, their souls is under the altar. The altar in the Bible is always a place of sacrifice. A sacrifice is for the forgiveness of sin, eh, for, the, for the reconciliation with God. It's, it's in the Old Testament. And Christ has done that. He is on the altar. He has been on the altar on the cross. But now you see them under the altar. And I believe that it is to be understood like uh, here it says that they have been slain. So they are under the altar, they have been slain. It talks about their ultimate martyr and the sacrifice that they had to give. Like for us, most of us probably will not have to suffer a martyr for our faith. We just turn to the grace of God and says, Lord, thank you, I receive you, I believe you, I believe you are my Savior. And the Bible tells you have been imparted the righteousness of God, you are accepted, you have a new way to God. Jesus says, no one will come to me, but by, uh, to God but by me. So we have that access to God al already. These people know, but they will have to pay a certain sacrifice 
in order to receive the white robe that we already have uh, received, okay? And to be rest. And also we see in this text a question that all generations, and, and probably you have asked these questions and everybody asks these questions, like how long, where is the justice of God? Look at how the world is going. This is a mess. How can God allow this to happen? How long will it be? You look at the, uh, the, the tsunami, you look at different things that happen in this world, the injustice, the persecutions of the Christians in so many countries. Where is God? Why does he allow that? That's exactly the question that is being asked right here. And God says the answer, or one answer at least, to, to satisfy them uh, for the time being. He says they were each one given a robe and told, okay, 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 relax, S uh, relax, wait, just be patient. I have not completed my plan yet. I've not finished. It's not coming to its term yet. Just wait a little longer because there are more of your fellow servants that will have to pay a similar price as just the one that you have paid. Just be patient. I will deal with this. I will deal with these people, but when it will be complete. Okay, they will be killed just as you have been. So there's an answer. So the answer is that suffering is not over yet. Injustice is not over yet. It's not going to be over yet. And because we are human beings, we are living here, God has a plan. But we have to trust God that at the end there will be a judgment. God is in control. He knows what he's doing. He's, he's got it covered. It's covered. I just need to live my life for him. I don't have to worry about why this, like when is it. I'm just being told, just rest, relax. You know, just let God fulfill his plan. That's, the, I think, the, 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 the emphasis here is not on the people, but it is on the question asked and the answer given. That's the emphasis of this text here. White robes are given uh, to them. Uh, next text. 12 to 14. The first four seals were about people and society. The first, and then here, when the six seals comes, we turn to nature. The first five seals were about people. The, the six seals, we turn to another uh, set of, of events. Here we see worldwide disasters. And behold, there was a great earthquake. And that was the part of my questions in the quiz this morning. Where is the first mention of the first earthquake? It is the first mention. Uh, when are the other coming? In chapter 11 and in chapter 16, there are two more earthquakes that will come. All of nature will be affected. The sun, the moon, the stars, as well as the heavens, the mountains, and the island. Then in verse 15 and 17, we see a group of people now. They are there, and how are they responding to all of these events that is happening, and they don't know uh, what, how, how to cope with that. In verse 15 and 16, pay attention to the, the people described here. The great ones, the rich, the powerful, and everyone, slave or free, rich or poor. There will be no rank of wealth w w from now on, starting in these in this seals, to deliver anyone from this terrible day of anger of God. It's not because you will be rich or wealthy or popular, a celebrity in Hollywood, or you have a mansion in many countries of the world, or you, you, you play in the best casinos of the world. There will be nothing like that anymore. And John includes the great ones, the generals, the military, the celebrities, like any, anybody that has the that their life is in control. They control people in the policies of the world. This is it. This is it. And what, what do you see from them in this text? Frighten. Frighten. They prefer that the caves and the rock falls on them rather than facing the anger of the Lamb. That's how frightened they are. Hide us in the caves of the mountains. And they ask the question, who shall be able to stand or to, to uh, go through these things or to support the, this kind of e e event? Okay. And there is a sentence that seem, maybe seems strange a bit. It's the phrase, the wrath of the lamb. Because a lamb normally is a, not 
you know, very strong and controlled. But here seems to be a contradiction because we are accustomed to emphasize the meekness and the gentleness of Jesus Christ. But there will come a time where his holiness and his justice will prevail. And if men and women will not yield to the love of God now in the time of grace, and they will not be changed by the grace of God, then there is no way for them to escape this time. We are privileged, if you believe. That's why there is a promise, blessed are you, if you uh, read aloud, hear, and retain this one, you are blessed because you are part of those who go up on the fourth floor. You know these events, but you are privileged. And I want to go a bit uh, further in that. Chapter uh, 7, verse 9 to 10, I want to introduce another group of people. We'll go quickly. And I looked, and behold, a great multitude, and this, this one has become a song that many churches sing worldwide, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robe, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Who are these people in that group? that we find. The answer is asked in verse 13 and 14. Go to 13 and 14. Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? That's very precise questions. Who are this group, this great multitudes in the, uh, in the New Testament? Okay, because sometimes we may think, oh, it looks like, like the church, but does it describe the church? Verse 14, I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. So here you see a great multitude of people, and they are Gentiles. They are people from all the nations. The first group, many believe that, the, that we read under the altar that they were more like Jewish people, and that these ones are really the Gentiles, the rest of the nations that have joined. And you know, if you remember history a bit, and the Cultural Revolution, for example, we think of the Cultural Revolution as one big revolution, but actually there were five uh, big peak or persecutions like different uh, uh, periods in the, uh, the Cultural Revolution over a number of years. So we believe that in the book of Revelation there will be something like this. These times of persecutions where people who are, want to be faithful to God will be slain, there will be different period, like uh, different waves of persecutions or intense persecutions and intense, you know, killing. Uh, the government will not always, like uh, 375 days, uh, uh, days a, a year uh, for so many years, always every day is chase people. There will be time when the, the policies will be find them, kill them. And then after that, there will be time to go to other activities. And then another time will be find them, kill them again, or something like that. So I, I, believe, I believe this. So, so there were these, these groups of people are found, uh, this one, with a white robe, and they are there. But these ones are resting in the presence of the, uh, of, of the Lamb already. Not resurrected but they are, you know, the soul, their soul is there. Verse 15, I want to just go quickly about that, and I'm closing with that, because that's the point where I want to uh, close today. Therefore, these people are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple, and He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall un hunger no more, never thirst any more, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that, I want to close with the slides and just that we'll go over that, the blessings of us being near God. Even though this one describes these people that have been given a white robe, and they have been slain for the sacrifice and the tribulation from all the nations. But we who are believing in Jesus right now, we will be in the presence of God. So we will enjoy these benefits. So I just want to remind you of the benefits of you following God, trusting the Lord, and what, what, what is your future kind of be, will be like, okay? 
So you will have a, a perfect nearness. Okay, you will be with God. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. You will have uh, access to the throne of God. Okay, so that is your that is your your privilege to be there with God. Perfect service. You will be in His temple, like. You will be active with with him. Uh, you will be like you know when we were the English camp this week. We were doing things as we were ministering. So something like that. We will be busy in the Lord, doing things that needs to be done at that time. Uh, happy to 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 serve. Happy to be with him. Perfect fellowship. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. So his presence will be enjoying perfect satisfaction. There will be no more hunger, thirst, or anything. So we will be our our needs will be met spiritually, physically, everything. Like there will be no more insecurities. Uh, you know everything. We will be completely uh, satisfied in the Lord. Perfect security. Uh, no more danger. No more harm, no more persecutions, nothing will uh, harm us, or like, uh, disasters or anything. And perfect guidance for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will, what? Shepherd them. Did that be a nice picture, like taking care, leading to the green pastures, uh, where the, what we need, and leading us to the fountains of the waters of life in perfect joy. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No more sorrow, regret, things of the past, you know. You know, when we get saved, we are freed from all of our sin in the past, like all the horrible things that we may have done in the past, and the things that we regret, we are ashamed of. And we receive God's grace and we say, thank you, Jesus, you forgave my sin. But we have a memory that reminds us sometimes it comes. And we have to deal with that because a memory and the faith that we have in the, what Christ has accomplished is two separate things. Uh, even if you have a, a memory that saddens you of what you have been in the past, doesn't mean that you need to repent again. You have been uh, justified of that. You have been saved of that. You have been forgiven of that. But the memory is something that reminds to us like the evil of our past. So there, there would be no more memory. It would be clean. You know, like a new, new uh, computer, you just wipe everything, start again, reformat. We will be reformatted in the presence of God there. Okay, let us stand together this morning because we need to worship the Lord as we close. You have heard about the coming events. You saw three groups of people this morning. You saw three groups of people. We'd like to sing uh, Salvation Belongs to the Lord, you know, yeah. We saw three groups of people this morning and different attitudes of them. One group were scared. One group cried and asked the question, how long, how long before you avenge us? And the third group, they are celebrating their salvation. Salvation belongs to the Lord. They are singing that glorious song. We are closing this year, 2013. What lesson can we draw from this text this morning? As the truth, the blessing of revelations, the promises we find there, influenced or guided your life, your goals, your achievement this last year. How much have you been impacted? You know, another thing that we have to realize when you look at these last groups, the great multitude that no one could number, these are only the ones who came from the tribulation, but that is beyond from eternity until now. All those who have been saved in the Lord, there will be such a glorious number of people. And in this text, we see we should develop a global outlook in our faith. That's why I chose the, the picture of our monthly uh, uh, magazine this week, The Eye with the Globe, because that's how God sees the world. This is the vision of God. God sees the global 
that he wants to accomplish. And many times we focus on our family, we focus on our wallet, we focus on our savings, we focus on, on the local, we focus on the present. And it's, it's okay, it's part of life. But we should also get the global of God. If we want to follow God and be effective and bear fruit without being global, we cannot. We will miss out. We will misunderstand the times, the events, and the role that Christ has ascribed to His church. So we need to, like God, who sees, you know, all tribes, all nations, all people, all languages. That is part of us. That is part of our global vision. So when you read the book of Revelation, it brings you right in your face the global worldview of God. And we need to embrace that this morning. So in this year, 2014, when it will start, why not think about God, give me your vision, a more global vision of the time in which we, we are, and how I can prepare myself for your plans. And we talked about the worship of God this morning. How is your worship? How intense, how deep it is. Hallelujah. If you don't receive the love of God now and let the, change, the grace of God change you, what hope do you have? Hallelujah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne and on to the land He prays and glory wisdom Let's raise our hands in the presence of the Lord and worship.